So thank you all for coming. Um, this is very exciting to have two wonderful collectors and friends here. And many of you in this audience have come to our past ones on conversations with collectors. So I think we learn all sorts of interesting things about what makes collectors tick and what we can learn from them. Um, I'm especially delighted to welcome Drs. Elizabeth Moyer and Michael Pawanda here because we have an unusual history, which um, began in Charlottesville because I was director of the University of Virginia Art Museum and Elizabeth is a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. And they have long been active with special collections there and a little bit with the museum. And then when they, um, and then when I moved to the West Coast, I became even closer. So um, we have developed a wonderful friendship since then in so many ways, and they have been enormously helpful to this museum, again, in so many ways that we have all benefited and enjoyed this relationship. Um, at different levels, from art to wine to conversation, and if you are members, then you may have seen the little icon that we've put in the membership members magazine on art and science. So we have a number of events throughout the year that connect the arts and science together in innovative, unusual ways, including Barbara McCallum's exhibition, which is based on her husband's science. But we have with us two scientists who collect. And I'm not going to tell you a lot about them because I think that they will unfold their stories as they show you how their collection has developed. So they have put a lot of thought, I think, into um, sharing this with you um, from a chronological portrait, in a way, to um, where you are today. And then they will so the plan today is that they've brought a lot of images and they will go through these to show you how they develop their collection and each other, your relationship with each other and the collections you've developed together. And then we'll do a conversation after that and open that up to all of you as well. Um, what I think they will do is, and maybe you should stand so they know who you are, and I, and I don't know if you want to say anything while you're standing, because I think what we'll do for the first part is look at images while they talk, right? Yeah. Other than, other than starting with a paragraph that talks about what the collection consists of, okay. I think. So I'm going to turn this over to them to take it from here, okay. however it's best, OK? Mm -hmm. And then we'll turn the lights down when the images come up and turn them back again when we all get together to talk more. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So we described the KMP collection a century in the making. And the reason we come to this statement is the collection contains art and artifacts, including Chinese bronze vessels and mirrors, snuff bottles, ceramics, and teapots, Japanese prints, katagami stencils and ceramics, American and European art glass and pottery, Middle Eastern and Mediterranean artifacts, artist books, and works on paper from the 17th to the 21st century. The collection originates with inherited as well as acquired artifacts by Edwin Kirk and his wife, Paige Taylor Kirk, made prior to 1954. So the K stands for Kirk, and M, I think, would be Moyer, and P would be me. So Elizabeth, uh, let me go give you a a device. Thank you. Utter darkness, yes. It's a good thing you didn't do that before I read it. So <laughs> this talk is going to be divided into, I think, four sections. Yes. The first section is talking about the Kirk part of the collection, which was before, um, really before I was more than two years old and before, obviously, Michael and I got together. And the collection began, if you will, with the marriage of art and science. This is my grandfather, as drawn by my grandmother. Um, he was a paleontologist, and she was an artist who trained at the Corcoran. Um, she then, because she was supporting her sisters and her family, um, became a school teacher in the Washington School di District 
and taught both mechanical drawing. She also did the theater um, sets and costuming. Grandfather spent most of his um, active life in the Wild West, if you will, and he loved pictures and art relating to the things that he knew and loved when he was collecting fossils. He had grown up in the Dakota territories and started with collecting fossils as showing, being a scout for some of the more important paleontologists of the era. They were then responsible for getting him into college and then um, graduate school. And so he spent his life in Arizona, Wyoming, um, California, collecting fossils in the back of beyond. But as a scientist, grandfather also was interested in the media of art. And so one of the things that I think he found fascinating about this is that it, although it's an engraving, it is an image that um, is a good mimic of some of the red crayon drawings of the 18th century. This one is interesting because it's a, an artist named William Russell Flint. He's much better known for some of his later uh, watercolors that were of women in gauzes and in seraglios and places like that. But at this point, he was very much doing um, engravings and dry point. And I think what grandfather, although he liked the art, I think what really got grandfather about this artist was that he did a series of engravings that were printed on paper. So this one was printed on Watman paper from 1796. And this paper was incredibly famous at its time. Early drafts of the Constitution were written on it. Music was written on it. Jefferson did architectural drawings on this paper. And this shows you the watermark. It's half of the watermark. The other half says Watman. But I think grandfather knew what the watermark was and had looked at it and got pleasure in all of these levels of the art and the paper and the watermark. He enjoyed very much also just the joy of living, and um, he had a bunch of ostadas. He grandmother was, as an artist, part of the artist circle in the Washington area from um, before World War I until she retired. One of the artists in those days was Ernest Roth, and so this was a Christmas card that they got. This is one of grandmother's um, paintings. When she was at the Corcoran, you had to do 15-minute studies. And this is one that she did. This is an oil that she did. And this is of one of their friends, Doris Cochran. Doris Cochran became the first woman curator of a collection at the Smithsonian. And she was interested in frogs. And she, like grandmother, went to the um, Cochran to learn to draw, in her case, she was interested in doing medical illustrations. Grandmother also did medical illustration or scientific illustrations for her husband for his fossils. This is one of Alice, Doris Cochran's um, drawings. It's in the Smithsonian Archives. This is one of my favorite um, inheritances from my grandmother. It's a Helen Hyde. And what I love is. You've got the cat at one end, and you've got the little kid at the other. <laughs> and it's, it's not one of those icky, sweet Helen Hides, but I just, it, I always liked it. And this kind of shows what grandfather thought of grandmother in a way. I think this was collected, um, it's an Edward Burns Jones, because it reminded him of her in some ways. Now I pass it to Michael. Now all I have to do is make sure I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, so uh, that's the first piece that I bought. I had come on active duty. I actually had a salary. I went down to Washington, D.C., uh, and I met a gallerist called Jane Haslam. Uh, she just closed a gallery in 2015. For about six months, I came down every month, and she allowed me to go through each one of the print drawers and to explain about the technique and who the artists were. Now, I had started out going to New York City. It was a five-cent subway ride in those days, and the museums were free. So most of what I saw in high school and college were paintings and statues, unlikely 
did I think I was going to get enough money to buy any of those. The concept after six months of visiting with Jane Hansel was I could buy absolutely brilliant work by superb artists. Oh, but it was in multiples. But it was brilliant. And so the, it, you know, the expression of the light bulb going off, I'm not sure. It's probably more flickered. But uh, <laughs> so uh, that's the first piece. Uh, it sometimes disconcerts people. It sits over our dining room table. I guess you could say it reminds us not to waste any food, but uh, 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 you know. Uh, Bob Petterty, uh, he served in the military in World War II. He, to my mind, created the most succinct image of the horror and suffering of both soldiers and captives and prisoners. Uh, using a, a basic elements of a basic Christian image, uh, I think it's f f absolutely incredible. Uh, the Jordan Snitzer has it as it was part of uh, a, a show called "Lest We Forget," that was beautifully done here. Uh, this is another pedity, and for a biologist, the, you know, you look down a microscope and low power, medium power, high power. So that could be one of the reasons that I had an attraction for it. But it also was something that provoked in me questions, not necessarily answers, of truth, beauty, good, evil. Uh, or you know, could you have seen an image of a, a German major standing over a trench saying, move that body to the left to make a better composition? I don't mean to be trivial about that, but uh, it is, for me, a very provocative print. And the Jordan Sense now has that as well. Uh, John Taylor Arms, architect by training, an incredible uh, etching. I mean, he did, the, he did this level of work into his 50s without glasses. And just wonderful detail. Just um, we'll leave it there. And then growing up outside of New York and spending time in New York in those days, in the 50s and 60s, Allen Street, uh, the elevated was there. It could well have also been in Chicago, but this, I choose to prefer to view it as New York. And uh, Lozowick just did such wonderful things with black and white. This is from the edition that was spe specifically printed to celebrate his uh, the final retrospective somewhere in 70 or 71 at the Whitney. Uh, John Sirica, not the judge, but his nephew. Uh, the, uh, I took a course in etching an aquatint from him, and I saw that dry point, and I said, well, I think I need that. And you know, uh, Luther is a provocative figure anyway. Uh, you know, that's sort of the negative image. Uh, that's the way I looked at it, because you're seeing what buildings were there by the leftovers stuck to other buildings. Uh, and in some ways, that appeals to me. Uh, Mish Cohn, uh, you just, you either like him or you don't like him. He, he does sugar lifts as well as wood engravings. Um, I tend to like representative art, and I'm not quite sure this would fit that category. Uh, but it's, it really is uh, quite dynamic, dynamic. My first color piece. So how did I wind up with a uh, work on paper and color? I'd been in the hospital with a misdiagnosis, uh, and I was, uh, shall we say, angry when I got out. So I asked Harry Lund, to buy me a James, the James Enzor Vengeance of Pop Frog. Uh, that is, to this day, a wonderful print. Uh, but I went back to Harry and I said, Harry, this really needs to go into a university museum. And he looked at me as if I were crazy. He said, you're not going to get a lot of money for it. I said, Harry, make it, make it so. That was before Star Trek, I think. Oh, <laughs> about that time. Anyway. Uh, before you watched it. Stop yeah, it. probably. Uh, and so I, you know, I basically had a line of credit. And I'd walk into his uh, gallery about 
you know, once every two or three months, and he had just pulled out a package, and this was sitting there on the floor. And I said, Harry, uh, let's deduct that from what uh, you owe me. And so I wound up getting seven different prints uh, for the price of the Enzo. Uh, but this was just fascinating me because Richard Linda used just enough pigment to be provocative without trying to fill in all the details. And you start looking at these people, and other than one, other than the one in cuffs, uh, you know, is one of those an agent? Is one of those a knock? Is one of those a drug dealer? Or is none of the above? It's just uh, a fun piece. Uh, one of my other first early uh, color pieces, we have the black and white one sitting on our wall. And the color one came up, and I asked Harry to go buy it because I wanted to see how they differ. I tend to favor the black and white one a little more, but it's still a nice uh, uh, composition. This guy printed it all at one time. Uh, so each thing was hand painted, if you will, run through the press. Then the next one was hand painted and run through the press again. Uh, so there weren't multiple plates. There was a single plate for this. Uh, I just happen to like that. There's something about the light and dark in that uh, that is brilliant. And Grace Arnold, Obi, is not a particularly well-known artist, but I think some of her stuff is uh, exquisite. And it doesn't have to be exp uh, expensive to be good. Uh, I was stationed in San Antonio, walked into a, a park near the Whitty Museum, and this artist and a few others were selling uh, works on paper. Um, to say this was unusual, I've got, we've got five of them in the collection, uh, but it was, I guess, fantastical, uh, not surrealist, just sort of primitive in a way. Uh, you know, it was, uh, is that a spaceman on the left side uh, meeting one of our uh, ancestors? Who knows? Anyway, fun. Uh, got, I think that was $100. Uh, hopefully it kept the artist going. Uh, and it, he was, the last time I saw works from him were uh, 2015 in the catalog that we sponsored. Jim Sundquist, a superb craftsman with a crayon. Uh, he could do magic with it. Could not print to save his life. Fortunately, I think John Sirico actually printed this for him. Um, but this is, he was doing details of buildings in Washington. And that sort of red window and the green stripe just, I, well, we have it, so it is. And so, Perry E. Perry meeting, you know, oh, that E is Elizabeth, by the way, just. <laughs> so, Perry E, in this case, is things that each of us bought either for the other or with the other in the period when we were courting. This is one of the very first things that Michael ever gave me. I was in Buffalo at the time, and he was in San Antonio. And the other thing that he gave me around the same time was a suitcase, which I think was supposed to be a subtle hint. <laughs> but this, the original of this Zeman is actually about the size of a large postage stamp. But um, it's, I've always loved it, I think, partly because of its, where it came from. But, it's an example of how you can get really nice things that are not terribly expensive. This, so one of the things that Michael did that I thought, I think his, his Jane Haslam gallerist thought was insane is that he gave me a line of credit and said, um, there's this woman who's going to be coming into your studio, and I want you to let her buy anything on approval, of course, but anything up to the limit of the line of credit. And this is one of the things that I picked. And um, the artist is actually the son of someone who's more famous. I didn't like the more famous father's stuff as much, partly because it tends to be much larger. Um, and it would have exhausted my line of credit, basically. <laughs> but um, I like this because it really, to me, captured wings being bound and still fluttering. And I thought it was, I thought it was just great. This is one that I bought. We were um, in Maine. And again, I suppose it's the grandfather in me that it's one of those um, takeoffs on some of the drawings that they did in the 
15 and 1600s where you took something and you looked at different perspectives on it, including conical ones of a porcupine. And this is one that okay. Michael did. So uh, I was taking a course in lithography from Kent Rush. Kent Rush came out here and uh, gave a series of uh, lecture and, and a demonstration. Uh, and so I met Elizabeth in Dallas at a scientific meeting. I got up and uh, in those days in polite society, you gave your name and then you asked the question. Well, um, she heard my name and I don't think there was any expletive that followed, but uh, what had happened is she had referenced work that I had done in her thesis. So she knew the name, not the person, just the name. So I went back after the meeting and after we met and after having dinner at the old Warsaw and with the help of a, a brilliant uh, calligrapher, Corinda Allison, uh, did a transfer of uh, lithograph celebrating Dallas 11, 1979. And then, of course, being the arrogant person that I sometimes can be, I did a rainbow roll. I mean, in those days, if you didn't try a rainbow roll, you just weren't <laughs> trying. Uh, I must admit, in some ways, I liked the black and white a little better, but this, this was still fun. I think the next is going to go to, oops, present -y. So let's see, both of us can wind up talking about this. So every once in a while, we find something that allows us to poke fun at ourselves. So the piano in the background dates back to that 79 meeting when there was a woman <coughs> playing Chopin in the old Warsaw. Uh, Which is I, the restaurant where we had our first dinner and, together. And so, I, you know, I still wear braces these, well, I didn't wear braces in those days, but I do now. Uh, I don't wear bow ties. Uh, and this just sort of looked like, uh, you know, a, a Jersey City boy in a mall uh, <laughs> in, a, in a place of uh, some ill repute seemed to be just the right thing to uh, be. This one is uh, a guy named Mil uh, Miguel Conde, uh, and this is Ulysses. Ulysses is both the writer, uh, the book, and of course, uh, that guy out searching for whatever. I don't know if he ever got it, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, he got home. He got home. But I'm not sure that was exactly what he totally wanted at the end of the day. Uh, we've always liked Vuillard, uh, but we haven't quite been able to afford some of the more elegant ones. We came across this one, and we think it's, uh, it's probably an early state. There's been some stuff added to it. It's unsigned, but it is uh, identified in the catalogs. Uh, and we liked it. Uh, this is a, a, a living artist, a uh, painter in Washington, D.C., who does these images in such a way they look, at least to our eyes, like they're 19th century. Uh, and that's just uh, a, a delightful image for us. But it's, for us, it's also surprising that this is a mezzotint. I mean, it looks like dry point, it looks like an etching, but it actually is a mesotint, which is a medium that we like very much. This woman, I will not pronounce her name because I'm told I don't do it well. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, among other things, she f was a fighter in the resistance in World War II. Uh, she helped Hans Belma uh, create some of his etchings. And you can see that somewhat surreal surrealistic aspect of it, uh, wonderful repetition. And those two sort of ladders going off, or was that just state three? Uh, but it just had has sort of a uh, exquisite composition to it. Uh, this is Micah Schwabro, Woodblock. Uh, he is, uh, he was trained by- uh, uh, Yoshida, uh, and uh, lives in Santa Rosa, does, uh, this is one, I think, one of his even more fantastical ones. 
He carves his uh, back up my card. Okay. He, he carves his own blocks, and um, he's um, also been doing some collages, which I think are fascinating. And he actually was born and lived in his early days in Eugene. Uh, that is the first image uh, by Gabriel Petterty of which supposedly there are copies. He did it in 1934. Uh, it was printed in 1936. The first three images he created in the catalog says uh, the plates were destroyed, uh, and I've not seen an earlier image. So since I have this fascination for Petterty, uh, having that first one was important. And so, you know, he's giving the nod to a, a predecessor, maybe even making a claim, uh, Dura's uh, rhino, uh, and at the same time sort of saying, hmm, you know, things are not doing well. Uh, he was born in Hungary in 1915, and by that time he had been in Italy on an award, uh, he had an award to go to Italy at 18, uh, and you know, the Europe was not starting to look very good, and so there's a sort of history, if you will, celebrating history, uh, or I'd like to think that, in terms of past history, Dura, and present history. Chaos. Ah, uh, so this is the, the four more famous uh, Lazansky, Mauricio, uh, and I admit that I don't have a fondness for most of his stuff, but who could turn down, as both of us being uh, biochemists, uh, an etching of Marie Curie? Uh, and then, of course, since we like the mechanism of printing, uh, this guy is now in, I guess, the French National Academy. Um, but he does these exquisite detailed etchings, and this apparently was one of the workshops that would print for him. Uh, it's Eric Desmarguier. Yes, well, I don't, I don't do any French, so. Okay, so Hiroshi Yoshida, you all know, well, he did a series of uh, five wood blocks, starting from the beginning to end, uh, showing you uh, how the, uh, you added color and uh, it developed. And the, at the end, the last two are uh, looking at the junk in the day, daytime and looking at it in the evening. So uh, it's the same blocks, it's just they've been inked completely differently. And so uh, Michael Schwabero did a uh, recent series, except he's using sailboats. Uh, and the sailboats are there. You can look them up. Uh, Ren Brown and a couple of other people have his work. And there, there is much fun. Uh, what that also, that collection also stimulated yes. us to um, when we went to Hamanishi san okay. studio um, to ask of him to make a mezzotint series showing the beginning from the early stages of the plate right through to the end. And that set is now at the Jordan Center. Uh, this is a person that we unfortunately haven't seen in a while. She, she lived in uh, San Francisco for a while and then went back to Vancouver because of family things. But she, she used to run a print shop. She did actual printing for people and as well as herself. And then uh, she moved into digital, and uh, she has a lot of fun because she takes things that she's done before and incorporates them into uh, either a theme or at least an image that we find interesting. And you know, who can turn down a lithographic stone, even if it hasn't been drawn upon? Uh, this is a, a man who recently died, DeWitt Hardy. Uh, it's not his best watercolor. Uh, but it's one of those uh, fun things in which, you know, you can see him drawing or the image and you can see his model. Uh, and if you will, it's an homage to my grandmother. Uh, now, we buy things sometimes for anniversaries. So uh, I used to have a poster with that image on it, but it didn't travel well, to say the least. Uh, so on the 30th anniversary that we met uh, in Dallas, uh, I looked online for auction and bought the six impromptus on Omar, Ka Omar Kayam, and that, uh, that's one of the, the six. 
uh, and just, you know. And it was the one on the poster. So, so Elizabeth got to see it, see it again. Uh, this was for a birthday? Yes. Okay. Um, Peter Milton, uh, a lot of fun. He found out that he was colorblind, so he started doing wor uh, works on paper, and pl uh, doing black and white, and apparently, as one of our curator friends says, he's the only person I know who's, who's made a, a real living at just doing black and white, other than photography. And his is, in fact, sort of partly photog photographic. So the Mary here is Mary Cassatt. And it's Degas in the With the, by the door. And this is Tori Grouney again, uh, reminiscing about being both in San Francisco and uh, in Vancouver. And the actual, we have to go change that. It's called San Francouver, yes. as opposed to San Francisco Spring. So you can sort of see a, a gradient move across. And then part of the story behind this is that there was a period of about two years where I was working in Vancouver and Michael was still back in California. And so I would come back very frequently and he would come visit me. And so this kind of celebrates the fact that that transitioning is all over the back together. Now the original of this was 82 inches by I think 40 or 42. And we asked Tori, we said, <clears throat> It ain't going to fit on our walls. It ain't going to fit in the print drawer. So about three years later, one a quarter size comes to us, and we said, fine, we can put that up on the wall. Uh, and so this, this is an artist, Carol Wax, who does absolutely luminous um, mezzotints. And when we saw this image, we absolutely had to buy it because right now, as um, Jill will tell you, it's hanging on a wall directly above my grandfather's microscope, which looks exactly like that. And then, of course, Hamanishi. Uh, we've run out of words, so we'll just you know, show the art. And then uh, to celebrate our 35th wedding anniversary when we were in Japan, uh, we asked uh, him to do uh, Ex Libris for us. And uh, he riffed on uh, Mount Fuji and, of course, the Great Wave and showed his printing press. And uh, his mezzotint tools. Yes. And then I think a word from the ultimate artist scientist. I think lights, camera, action, yes. Oh, still yeah. one more, Michael, will be there. One more? Yeah. Very. Oh, that kills it. Uh, yeah. We can't do life from here, I don't think. OK. <laughs> but this is the end of our presentation. OK. Yes, why not? Well, first, why don't we thank them for putting together this presentation? It gives you a really nice overview of the aspects of your collection. But I have to say, your collection is so deep and varied that if people thought this was all that you had, it would be just a touch of it. So I'm wondering if this is a really, I think, a hard question, but why do you collect what you collect? And has that changed over since the two of you've known each other? Uh, I think Elizabeth can start first. Uh, <laughs> well, it starts with Helen Hyde. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I um, I didn't collect a whole lot of the stuff that I grew up with, right. and I think one thing that is true is that people develop a love for things that they associate with their childhood and with with growing up and. For me, it was um, at least in part Helen Hyde, so I was drawn to Japanese woodblocks and to a certain extent Helen Hyde. Um, I actually, grandmother taught me how to do drawing and watercolor, so they appealed to me more. But I didn't have an overwhelming need to 
accumulate until I had some place to put it because, um, you know, in those years you're wandering around, you're, um, you're in college, you're a graduate student, you're a postdoc, you're in your first job. You know, that's kind of hard on the collection. <laughs> and so um, I don't think that I started collecting seriously until we started having a home. So for me, quite literally, the story about going to New York, uh, seeing the paintings and statues, and I wouldn't say being in awe of them, but being uh, thinking, if it, once you go into the Frick collection, the idea of being able to come down it from upstairs at night and walk with a brandy in your hand and a cigar uh, and look at this stuff. I mean, the two Holbeins, just that, you know, uh, it's, wow, that would be so nice. I just didn't think that's the way it would work out. So quite truly, meeting Jane Haslam, having her spend uh, about six months basically educating me in the techniques and the different artists, uh, was that moment in which uh, the collecting habit uh, really found uh, reasonable soil to grow and, and because some of them were so cheap. I mean, in those Siemens, uh, they're you know, about two by three inches. You could get them for $25 a piece. If you could he didn't find tell them. me that at the hearing. Yeah, yeah, okay. But, <laughs> but they were brilliant. Uh, those, that one uh, is interesting because if you put one in a frame and you put it on that wall, you could be in that where you're sitting and you could still see the detail in it. How he does that, I don't know, but still that was the, uh, and then, you know, it just, it sort of becomes a habit and then you see some things and I collected, uh, the focus of my collection in a sense was learning about different techniques and uh, so I've been getting different examples of things. Um, and I think the, even to this day, uh, it's somewhat unformed. It, uh, yes, it would be nice to have the one or two that I wouldn't mind having. Um, there is a panel of Panama Canal. And it's at lunchtime, and the crane is pulling these people up On from the ball, canal. A wrecking uh, ball? Uh, sure to go to lunch. Now, the one you see most often is the one where the crane's on the left. The one I want is the one with the crane in the middle because it reminds me so much of the vengeance of Hop Frog. Mm. But I've only seen it in a collection once. Mm. So that's something you want that you haven't been able to locate. What about the things that you think back and say, oh, we should have done that? Does that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. Are there any memorable ones there? Well, there's this artist named Escher. <laughs> and when Michael was collecting early on, um, they were fairly cheap. And um, we don't have any Eschers. They were except. one month's salary as a captain in the United States Army this at that time. This is an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Collectors know. You can work around it. <laughs> the, uh, there is one. Uh, as you notice, I do like the pedities, and I do think they speak for those who no longer have voice. But Otto Dix, his series, The Creek, I had one of those. It showed an image of a blown out apartment. You could see into the apartment, the bodies, and, and the like. And I had it on my wall, and I had it on my wall, and then I went back to Harry Ann and said, sorry, Harry. I." You know, I've been at autopsies. I've seen other things. Uh, no, um, I think it needs to go back. Uh, that one I actually regret. Uh, that should have been put in the drawer and kept. But uh, uh, he uh, he was a superb artist who who lived it. And this is the thing about Petity and uh, a few others. Uh, the artists who just didn't create because they were in the neighborhood, but uh, had this, uh, they were either in the trenches, they were in the mud, uh, they were places that they didn't want to be. And Petity is interesting uh, in that 
a lot of this later pieces tended to deal with nature and earth and germination and evolution as if he could, he found a refuge in his art uh, to allow him to, if you will, re regenerate himself. So I have another question and then maybe we open it up. But I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about your actual day jobs as biochemists, what you do and how that either affects or informs your love of art or collecting? All right. Um, we don't really do our day jobs as we used to do. We both trained as biochemists. We both worked in academia for a little while. And I spent 20 years in the Army doing research and development. Uh, we both worked on a problem in which how can you how can you define morbidity and mortality, and how can you tell the difference between a bacterial and a, a viral infection, because that makes a difference. But these days, what we do, uh, and we sort of reversed roles. I started out doing it, and now I'm sort of the back end, and Elizabeth is the front end of it. We work with generally small companies to help them to get together the information they need to go to the Food and Drug Administration to get into clinical trials. Now, how does that inform our art? Uh, I don't know if it does or not, but uh, a commander I had at the Army's burn unit, the Institute of Surgical Research, years after, uh, when he was selling his 85th uh, birthday, I saw an article he wrote in which he talked about the fact that he and his wife collected Japanese prints, including some that were uh, the same ones that the Wadsworth collected. And uh, he tells about the story. He said, basically, uh, you need to have something uh, that gives you perspective, uh, something other than your work. And uh, I guess in that sense, uh, though I don't think what we do now really informs precisely what we do, it is that perspective. I, you know, Elizabeth and I met as a function of science I don't think we would be together if there wasn't something else. And I think a lot was one of those connections. I would agree with Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. um, I would also say that I think um, we're having more appreciation, if you will, for some of the digital art going on as a function of um, some of the things that we're seeing with um, some of our clients are manipulating images in order to, to um, show greater depth in some things. And I think, um, so there is a little bit of that. But I think mainly for us, art is a, a place to, it's like working in a garden. It's where you, your soul get joy. So, yes? First of all, thank you for sharing uh, both Dow and your Why don't we? Sure. Um, I want to thank you for sharing, and it's the first time we met. I've, I've known a lot of collectors in the year, and I'll use kind of a little metaphor here. Oftentimes you see a, a, a somebody walking their dog, and the dog's pulling them along, and you say, is the, the you walking the dog, or is the dog walking you? And so in regards to collections, you, you might like something as you go, but now you've got this larger thing. Does the collection drive any of your choices, or do you still kind of keep independent from that? The collection drives them a little bit in the sense of uh, like filling in that pedity. Uh, because I'm so fond of pedity and we became so fond of it. Elizabeth still sort of mourns that the landscape of death is here, but we can still visit it. Uh, the, so there were things that one would like to see to fill in. Uh, the Pinnell, if it ever shows up. Um, the different techniques, if something's new, or a different artist that I'm a fairly biased person. I basically believe that if an artist cannot draw something that I can recognize, then whatever else the artist does, I'm not sure I'm ever going to be able to understand. Because I think good art tells us things that escape words. 
uh, even escape poetry. And, but there has to be some overlap. There seems to, has to be something that we both have in common where he or she then can lead me somewhere else. But without that, it's very difficult, uh, at least for me. Um, so I think, in a sense, art is, I don't know, I can't imagine I would have said it in high school, uh, but I think art is essential. Uh, my mother reminds me, when I moved into the first house I could afford, that uh, she watched me hanging the prints on the wall, less worried about the furniture. Uh, and. I think whether you see every image that you have hanging on the wall at every moment, it creates an envelope for you, an envelope which gives, uh, you know, it might be mild sustenance, uh, but it just, it gives you a world, if you will, uh, a bubble, but uh, which may be fragile, but still a world. I would also say that um, sometimes a, a, some art or artist just takes us over like a tsunami. Um, there's an artist that we gave one to, the Jordan Sitzer. It's Andreas Nodebaum. And Andreas was born in eastern Germany around the time of World War II being over. And his mother um, brought him up, and they were basically starving most of the time. And he and she escaped to, I believe, to West Germany. Yeah. And then, uh, Outside. And there, um, he started drawing and wonderful things. And um, so NASA and Boeing brought him over to the United States to be an artist for NASA. And um, his early stuff was representational, semi-representational. It was like space, the final frontier kind of stuff. But then he started doing these metal drawings. and. There wasn't any necessarily immediately recognizable image in it, but it gave a sense of incredible space and depth. And they just captured our hearts. And so we couldn't afford them, but eventually we did. But, you know, so I'd, I'd say there are definitely times when that dog comes out, nips us on the knees, and drags us off. And the thing about notabombs uh, is they, they're in layers, like classic paintings. And while they may be a, mostly a single color, you can imagine some of the historical paintings that used that color and that somehow he's extracted it out from all of these, put it together in his piece. And we have one that you will see at some point, so stay tuned. Well, as important as you've described, the uh, acquisition of your art and how important it is in your everyday lives to surround yourself with the art. Can you say a few words about what mental process you have to go when you think about disposing of your art? What does the disposition process mean? <clears throat> well, we can start with the notion of uh, one curator that we know well who said, you know, sometimes you just have to let them free, let somebody else have them. Um, of course, not all art should wind up in museums. And I think we agree with that. I think it depends upon which museum it is. One of the reasons we're involved with the Jordan Snitzer is the students and the uh, community actually get to see the art. The students get to work with the art. Um, there are repositories of art that almost no one ever gets into and sees and works with. Uh, so when we, shall we say, share our art, we want it to be uh, so other people get to have the kind of experience that we did. Uh, I mean, I, if somehow one could bottle the, that interaction between myself and Jane Haslam uh, and sort of give it out to young students as, uh, as an impetus or as, a, that would be absolutely wonderful and hopefully by sharing some of our art and with the people that are here, one is in fact doing that. I, we're also in the process right now of, of giving to the Jordan Snitzer a collection of prints by um, 
a Japanese artist called Kojo, and they are famous scenes from no place. And I'm sure that grandmother influenced grandfather to buy them or they bought them together because grandmother had that theater high school training um, important thing in her life. And so for us, it was obvious to get them here because it's going to get multidisciplinary use. It's going to give immediate pleasure. I mean. You know, it gave immediate pleasure to at least <laughs> one person. <laughs> Well, my question is the flip side of Jim's, and that is about the acquisition process. And you've partially answered it, I guess, earlier by your discussion. But I'm interested, since you are a couple, of the degree of interdependence, cooperation, uh, lively discussion, debate, or perhaps even disagreement <laughs> about acquiring any particular works or types of works. Um, I think if either of us hates it, it's out. If either of us loves it, it's up for consideration. If we both love it, it's in. If it's in, it's out. So I, I think if there's been anything that Michael really loved that I didn't see at first, it tells me I need to look at it again and vice versa. But if we both don't like it, it's no point. It, it sort of is an extension of one of the things we've written a number of papers together. One of the things we learned very early on was it's better for one of us to start the version, hand it to the other, and go as far away as possible <laughs> uh, because otherwise we would be fighting word by word, paragraph by paragraph. Uh, and so in some cases it's a uh, we bring things to the other person's attention, uh, but I think Elizabeth summed it up well. Uh, if we both like it, that's a go. If we, one of us hates it, it'll not make it. Uh, and then there are varying other things in which sometimes what you're doing is saying, well, wouldn't you rather have that one instead of that one? Uh, So you touched on it, um, the question before this, in terms of young collectors or people young, young in the sense of people who haven't started collecting, mm -hmm. but you know are kind of dabbling in there, interested. And Jane Anselm's gallery is not there anymore. So what would you recommend for people that think they like art, but they don't really know where to start? Well, I think that there are a number of um, other galleries that are still in play. And um, some of them have the smaller pieces, and some of them have, um, you know, even if you go to flea markets and you can find um, anonymous photographs that you absolutely love, and it will train your eye. But um, go to, uh, if you're going to be buying prints, go to a reputable dealer. Reputable dealer. <laughs> And um, they will, as Jane Haslam did for Michael, they will help and they will teach you things and how to see them. The, the other, uh, I only had one course in art in college, uh, one semester course by a woman named Sabine Gova, which we think really wasn't her name. <laughs> that, and I mean that because she apparently had been in the resistance in World War II and she was famous enough in her own right uh, that uh, when she walked into the Met and saw something that wasn't right, she could walk into the director's office and say, yeah, no. Oh. But, and so, it disappeared from view. Yes. Wow. Uh, but that was, you know, one course. And I, and I would argue that if it's the right course, then that would be a wonderful thing. The other is uh, there are some good general if you're interested in works on paper, there's some good general textbooks on how to do prints. There's a, a British uh, one called the Printmaker's Bible, I believe, uh, 
one of our friends says, you know, if you're going to start seriously collecting, you should spend a couple hundred dollars on books first before you do anything. That may or may not appeal to everybody, um, but if there's a course, uh, you know, a local artist is giving it a weekend course on how to do an etching or an engraving, go see if this is something that actually appeals to you, because some of it is a hands-on thing. Uh, and I say that because part of the collection that we inherited from Elizabeth's great, uh, grandfather was snuff bottles. Now, museums these days over, almost never show snuff bottles. And there are two reasons for them, one of which is easily lost. And the second of which is to ap truly appreciate a snuff bottle, you have to pick it up in your hand. There is, there is really no shortcut for that. I mean, there's, uh, yes, they're beautiful. You can look at them behind cases, but uh, until you feel the weight of it, the warmth of it, or the cool of it. Uh, so they're very hard to go show. But if you take courses, uh, you know, even if it's a, a brief semester, and I, I would think that every, every student who finishes a university should at least have a semester of art. And I especially think <coughs> all those who are in science should have a semester of art. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure I'll win that argument. Uh, but it just seems to inform one that there are other ways of viewing the world. And I think that's, that's uh, an interesting lesson that eventually, by the time you're my age, you perhaps even learn. Yeah. Or at least learn there are lots of different ways of viewing the world, yes. yeah. right? Oh, and the other thing, of course, since uh, miniatures, uh, you know in the old days that people collected prints and they didn't put them up on walls. They usually bound them into books. That's why some of those prints are so neatly trimmed to within a millimeter of the image. The nice thing about miniatures is you can go get an archival book uh, binder, and you can collect, and w your collection can travel wherever you are, and you can show it, uh, you can pack it in your bag, uh, you, can, you can build up from there, and there are wonderful people doing miniatures. Uh, there's also an annex gallery that does a day-by-day a -day, uh, listing of an artist and tells you about artists. It's a, it's a delightful education for free. And if you get up to Davidson Gallery, uh, or even go online, there are plenty of pieces of art that you can buy for about $100. For $1,000, I could go put together seven to nine pieces from very good artists, but that were just their little one-off pieces, which would be the start of a wonderful collection. Uh, I don't know how many Starbucks that is, but uh, <laughs> uh, but. But I'm not sure how much the Havanese ex libri sell, but they're not they're they're not much. expensive, and they're just a joy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you want to say something about Havanese, because people I here may the question. I know. Right. Know. Okay. We'll do that first. But if we've brought up his name a number of times, and people may not know the significance for us. Hi, I wanted to ask, uh, how often do you uh, p collect new pieces, and um, how have you dealt with spatial limitations for your collection? Um, when you say spatial limitations, there are a couple of ways of thinking of that. that a lot of our prints are not hanging on the wall at the same time. And works on paper, we really would prefer to rotate, because it's better to you know, not always have the same things up there. So um, we have a number of flat files, and we've, um, I think one of the things that we did before we were married was Michael bought an architect's um, set of drawers, and we finished it off together. And when we came out to California, it came with us. And some years later, we built a, a bookcase over it to hold the books that were about the prints. <laughs> And then some years later, we had a, an island made, if you will. And half of the island is drawers, and, and half of it is bookcases, and, half, and 
you know, there's places where you can see stuff as well. Um, so that's one answer. Another answer is um, when my mother died and we had a huge influx of stuff, we bought the house across the street. <laughs> uh, there is a man named Jamie Elder who uh, I knew in the mid-70s. Uh, knew is probably not that. I met him. Uh, he would collect only artists' self-portraits and uh, works on paper. He lived in a one-bedroom apartment. He collected 500 of them and stored them underneath his bed. When he died, they went to the National Portrait Gallery. So a space is partly in your mind and partly, you know, uh, if you have really good visual memory, you may only have to see them once. Uh, we know a curator who, when he sees a drawing 20 years later, he can say, that dirt mark wasn't there before. <laughs> and I think now one of the things that we're doing is, is we're giving things to the Jordan Sitzer. I mean, when my mother died, there was a lot of stuff that I really absolutely adored that I'd grown up with. And there was no way I could find a place for it. But my brother could find some places for it. And so somehow I found that as long as you can visit it, it's, and it's, you know, you don't have to control it. You can just come and see it when that urge happens. So um, we have invoked the name of Hamanishi Katsunori, who is a contemporary Japanese mezzotint artist. So this touches on both the Japan aspect a la Helen Hyde that came through Elizabeth's youth and the, um, obviously the interest in mezzotint, which is shared by both Michael and Elizabeth. So um, Hamanishi Katsunori was one of the artists that was featured in the Expanding Frontiers exhibition that we had done in November of 2015 with a great deal of student input and a wonderful collection from the Jack and Susie Wadsworth collection. And because I knew Michael and Elizabeth and because I love Hamanishi's works, those were some of the first prints that I had acquired when I got to this museum. Um, when the time came to decide which artist we were going to invite, to speak during the Wadsworth exhibition, we all collectively thought, Hamanishi. So this is one of those wonderful stone gathering moss type of situations in which a wonderful gift at an exhibition and a student project begets the opportunity to bring an artist with whom we develop more ties. Hamanishi has come twice now. Um, he came during the 2015 exhibition. Um, he spoke in this very space, and at the end of his talk, he gave us the breathtakingly beautiful quadriptych that is on view upstairs in our smaller Japanese gallery. And um, this summer, he came again. And so we had the pleasure of um, having another um, artist demo here. There were two demos in the Whitaker print uh, shops, and um, we were able to acquire another wonderful quadriptych by Hamanishi that you will see featured in our next Japanese gallery rotation. So. Um, periodically, the museum does trips to Asia. I've had the pleasure of traveling with the Puandas um, to both Korea and to Japan. And lo and behold, when I was deciding where should we go, well, we thought, well, why don't we go to Hamanishi Katsunori's studio? So um, in Japan, we had the pleasure of taking our entire group to visit his mezzotint making studio. And the image that they had showed that had Mount Fuji in the background at sunset with the Hokusai great wave um, derived imagery and the mesotint making tools and press um, came directly out of our experience because we were there at sunset. You can see Mount Fuji from his uh, back porch and we were all there together. Um, and so it was a really wonderful encapsulation, kind of a distillation of our experience. Um, they talked about what they might like. He sent them drawings. I was involved in the translation of some of the um, ideas going back and forth. And subsequent to that, they ended up um, uh, commissioning another series, which was invoked for a moment um, when we, they were talking about the um, Yoshida Hiroshi series of boats, very famous series of a mid 20th century Japanese Shinhanga artist. Um, who used the same blocks to reprint. And it's a kind of wonderful celebration of the capabilities of the printmaking technique. So they said, well, I wonder if there's some way that Hamanishi might do something along those lines. Um, he, Hamanishi, was thrilled to be asked to do something that wasn't just, oh, another 
this or another that, but something that actually sort of dug in deep and spoke to his method, to his, the technique that he uses. And so they, again, because this is all part of a larger experience, he invoked the Hokusai Great Wave. He did a kimono image because he knew that they already owned a wonderful kimono image, a large print by him, and um, was able to create a series of images that show how you build up a mezzotint, first by burnishing, the, I'm sorry, first by uh, roughening a plate, then by burnishing, then by um, you know all the different stages, and he does a color technique as well. So we are very fortunate that we have a complete set of those. And when he came this summer, he was kind enough to give us the original drawing and the template that he used. So for us as a teaching museum, it is so exciting to have things that speak to process and you know, it's just kind of a wonderful, happy package that the relationships that have developed between collectors, museums, students, and artists is all so beautifully tied up in that bundle. Well, I think our evening has come to an end. So thank you so much for sharing your passion for collecting, what makes it happen, and getting um, enabling us to get to know you a little better. And let's thank them. <laughs>